to all our participants in Germany and likewise a good evening to our listeners here in Australia. I'm delighted to welcome you in such a great number to our webinar today. Our topic for today is from German efficiency to Aussie affordability, making it work. Before we kick off the webinar, let's address some administrative matters. Please note that this event will be recorded. This is a webinar and the speakers are not able to see or to hear you. You can use the chat function to interact with speakers and participants. Please use the Q&A function to ask questions during the Q&A session. Please do not use the chat button for it. Now let's get started. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is, my name is Cornelia Camacho and I'm a customer success manager at the German Australian Chamber of Industry and Commerce. We primarily assist German companies with any questions related to doing business down under and provide a wide range of services in this regard. Our services can be categorized in the three main pillars. The first pillar encompasses all aspects of the market entry. We provide you with general information about the Australian market. With our business partner matching, we find the right distribution partner or business collaborator tailored to your requirements. Business incorporation. Here, we follow a very structured approach using a questionnaire and act as your helping hand working together with our service providers to facilitate the registration of your company here in Australia. The second pillar addresses all topics related to the market expansion. This includes the creation of market studies or market analysis specific to your products and your industry or niche. We offer you the option to establish a swift and professional business presence in Australia by providing a virtual business address and an Australian landline phone number to handle initial customer and prospect inquiries. We also provide information about other business expansions. The third pillar takes care of all other services. For example, trade fair support. We attend trade fairs on your behalf, exhibit, and engage in discussions with potential customers or act as your representative. We organize intercultural workshops to illustrate the difference in business conduct and negotiation methods. And this is our topic tonight. This is why we are all here today. Events and membership, what can we offer here for you? a dynamic platform for exchanging market development and trends. As a member, you have exclusive access to our own developed talent pool. We provide a wide variety of events with the goal of delivering more content and creating contacts for you through webinars, publications, trade uh, fair participations, and we do that even in Germany. They are premium partner programs with the creation of company videos and support for maximum visibility of your brand. Function specific round tables such as HR, CFO, marketing and ESG circles are um, really um, an interesting feature we have here too. And at uh, the end to mention is Connect um, AHK, this is an event what we had in the past before COVID. And here we invite you to network under a specific theme. In the areas related to market entry, we collaborate closely with experts from our network. Please note that all information shared during this webinar is of general nature and does not constitute individual legal advice. Therefore, we recommend seeking professional guidance before engaging in any business activities in Australia. Australia is really known for being robust and its multicultural diversity. 
intercultural working is an enriching but often a very complex aspect of today's globalized business world where understanding empathy and effective collaboration play critical roles learning and adapting to other cultures are possible over time but in the business world time equates to money therefore operating successfully in australia and achieving a quick start means being skilled in attitudes behaviors and of course the language i'm always curious and passionate about how the chamber can assist in your business endeavors in australia and vice versa that's why i believed that today's topic will greatly interest you the high registration numbers for this webinar and the linkedin likes we got are i guess a testament to this now it's our turn to provide provide you with facts and tips moving beyond stereotypical statements for a manager or leader who has moved from a german head office to take charge of australian operations or for an australian leader responsible for reporting to a german head office and boss the demands and challenges become more pronounced meeting the expectations of immediately fulfilling a mandate in australian business while comprehending the underlying elements of the new culture and subcultures how things are accomplished in this environment is not only critical crucial but also a game changing factor in recent months when i was visiting members in their business and i was asking them how they are doing and how hard or easy it is to do business in australia this topic of culture differences was brought up by nearly everyone i have spoken to i realized this is a hot topic and i didn't have to search long to find the right expert in this field it is my absolute pleasure to welcome our today's speaker joanne fisher from fisher people in culture Joanne Fisher founded Fisher People in Culture to bring the latest expertise from the fields of neuro leadership, executive coaching, emotional intelligence and organizational culture to busy business and HR leaders of SMEs. Her mission is helping SMEs create accelerated growth via the power of optimal cultural foundations underpinned by the neuroscience of leadership culture and performance. Joanne has worked with clients from around the globe, having lived and worked in Germany, Asia and Australia. She has partnered with and worked in SMEs to effectively lead across diverse cultures, manage transformation, build collaborative teams and facilitate leadership development. Following the presentation, Joanne will be available to answer individual questions at the end of our presentation as i mentioned you can ask questions by typing them into the qa but we will uh, prompt you to it please understand that due to time constraints not every question may be addressed especially if they are highly individual we will make an effort to collect these questions and provide answers possibly following the webinar so before I hand over to Joanne, we would like you, our audience, to join us voluntarily to participate in an interactive activity. Please get your mobile phones out and scan the QR code, which should be seen on your screen right now. And you will see then there will be our first question coming up. And the first question we would like to ask you is, what do you associate with intercultural working? So we will give you a little bit of time because you have to scan. We know that takes a bit, uh, but it would be really great if we could have your thoughts. And what will happen then? If we get from you some responses, it should actually 
um, bring us your results here on the screen. Yeah, and it has worked. Fantastic. We will not go here um, through each um, response you um, have given, but I think we can have a quick glance at it. And I'm sure, Joanne, you will have a good eye on the answers and um, it will be in the back of your mind. Fantastic. Yeah, understanding differences, communication, of course, global teams. Fantastic. I think we can move on then to the second um, question, which is um, please name a few do's and don'ts for Australia. So what shouldn't we um, do? And um, what should we do? Uh, definitely collaboration is very important. Don't hurry. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And the same thing we would like to do with um, uh, the do's and don'ts for Germany, if we can get also some of them. People are surely writing. And you can even write them in German, not a prom problem. Informality, definitely. Do not be late. Yes, that's exactly what it is. All right. We don't have to stress it, I guess. And we... Just continue, Joanne. I believe these answers are giving you a good overview and insight where the audience is with their knowledge of cultural differences. And with this, I would like now to hand over to you. And um, the floor is all yours. Thanks very much, Connie. And um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. I think we've covered all of the different time zones now. Um, I'll just share my screen. Um, is that you can see that? Yes, we yeah. can see. Okay, so uh, I've been looking forward to this presentation. It's always a topic that um, that I really enjoy and I think is very valuable. Uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of businesses that work across the German and the Australian divide, as well as uh, other other cultural um, interactions with other international places. Um, I think it's really it. I've I started working with Germany when I was uh, about 25 years old when I picked up packed up my bags and moved to Germany with my husband with the intention of staying for two years and we ended up staying about 10 the first time and we went back but since then I've developed a passion for working with German businesses um, for for my friends that I have over there and just with the um, with the richness of the uh, of working with the with German people and and sharing experiences, um, there's a lot of there's a, actually a lot of complementary approaches uh, between Germany and Australia, and there's a lot of people who work in that area who really enjoy it. So whilst we're going to talk about a lot of differences today, I think it's important to understand that there's also a lot of synergies as well. Um, but it is uh, important to uh, be able to navigate some of the subtle differences that happen. And um, when I arrived back uh, when I was 25 a long time ago, I, there were a lot of whys that I had to work out. For example, uh, I did training, I ran training courses for, for German managers. And one of the whys was why did they tell me that my coffee that I made looked like soapy water and tasted like soapy water? In my eyes, that was very rude. Um, uh, why do people invite you to go to lunch and then want to book a date two months in advance? I don't know what I'm going to be doing next week or the week after, but, the, but in Germany, my colleagues, they had lunch dates booked for two months in advance. Um, why, why, what do I say when people say Mahlzeit? Um, How do I reply to that? What does it mean? Um, 
and and the list goes on. Um, why do why do women in Germany have much deeper voices than in Australia? Um, so so that that was some whys that I had. Um, some of the whys that they had of me was why would you leave a, a great job in Australia and just pack up your bags and move to Germany without a job? Isn't that a big risk to your career? Um, why do I eat ice cream in the middle of winter? You would never do that. Um, why do I? Um, why do I get upset in the shops when the when the lady at the cash register starts yelling at the customer um, or me? Um, so there were there were there were some whys that I had to deal with. But I think what I learned was that um, that that the pi the picture is bigger than that, and we need to uh, sort of move away from stereotypes and really have a very open mind to understanding culture. So with that, I just want to um, take you through my presentation right so so what we're going to cover today is first of all I want to just give you a little bit of perspective on Germany and Australia and where we're coming from then I want to look at what is culture and why is it why is it everybody's business when it comes to business success then we're going to talk a little bit about the German Australian leadership path and I'm going to give you a model one of many models for us to try and get a lens around or a framework around navigating those differences. And then last of all, I want to share some real life insights from some of the managers that I've worked with in Australia, both German managers who have come here to lead a business or Australian managers who are leading a German business in Australia about what some of these differences look like on the ground and how they navigate them. So we've got a lot to cover, but let's get into it. Um, so, so basically, you know, Germany and Australia. In Germany, everybody lives in uh, Bavaria and goes to Oktoberfest, right? <laughs> and in Australia, everyone hangs out on Bondi Beach. Um, the, if we talk about stereotypes, they're the types of stories that we hear. But we all know that it's it's bigger than that. Um, if you look at if you look at the first big difference between Germany and Australia is that we're worlds apart. You know, we're a long way away from from one another. And the size of Germany and the size of Australia is very different. If we if we look at this in in terms of numbers, um, the 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 size the the square meter size of Germany is um, three and a half um, thousand kilometers. In Australia, it's seven seven point seven um, uh, million square kilometers. So it's a very big difference in size. And there's an inverse relationship with the population. You'll see that um, Germany is a lot more densely populated than Australia. Um, the GDP, there's a lot of difference in the in the size of the GDP between us between Germany, which is um, ranked third, and Australia ranked fourteenth. Um, and if you look at the different states, um, it's also interesting to look at that um, the largest states. Um, in terms of kilometres and population in Germany, they, they're sort of fairly well aligned. Um, so Bavaria, Lower Saxony, Baden-Württemberg and Nord Nordrhein-Westfalen are the, are the four biggest in, in square kilometres, but they're also the four biggest with a little bit of a change in the order in population. Um, but in Australia, the largest states... Um, Western Australia is the is 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 the largest, and it's one of the the, the least populated states. Um, Queensland, Northern Territory, South Australia, they're the biggest in size, but actually the biggest that are in population are New South Wales and Victoria, which are where the the capital cities and the main business cities are, um, and that's where that's where a lot of um, the German um, presence is in those two cities, although they are in other states as well. So that just gives you a picture of size. And if we put things in perspective, this just gives us a nice little picture of um, how big Australia is compared to some of the other countries um, in Europe and, and other parts of the world. Um, so this has a significant impact on um, aspects of the business that are navigated here in Australia compared to Germany. And one of my um, one of my clients who's been here for about a year now, who was transferred from his head office in Germany to a, to a Sydney, put it very nicely. He said that um, you live on an island at the bottom of the world. Always remember, you live on an island at the bottom of the world, far away from anybody else. It is kind of obvious, but it's 
easy, easily forgotten in this first world wealth functioning economy and country. And the reason he wrote that was that he's um, he was hired at he he rented a serviced office, and the lift um, broke. And he waited five months for the lift to be repaired. And that was because the, some of the parts, critical parts were missing. And it took so long to get those parts from um, the other parts of the world that they were needed from to, to Australia. So I thought that was a nice little comment that just kind of emphasises that um, we are a long way away. We are a, we are a well-functioning economy, but sometimes the distances um, mean that tra things like travel things like the way we go to market and the way we we interact with our clients, the way we the, the sales happen, and also the costs of logistics and travel and things like that are very different to in Australia. And that can be hard to navigate when you're trying to deal with um, German bosses who who have a different um, view. And we'll see that come up later on in the in our presentation. So uh, just, just to give you a broad context, in my view, I like to stay away from t stereotypes because I think culture is really a lens that we look at things through. So so I just wanted to kind of present this concept to you that culture is everybody's business. And um, it's one of the major obstacles um, to successful globalization. And indeed, also to integrations. It's one of the main things that stands in the way of integrating two different types of businesses or businesses from two different ends of the world as well. Um, so it's something that we all have to understand. And culture or cultural awareness is just as linked to business success as strategy and leadership. In fact, strategy is enabled by culture and leader leadership is one of the enablers. So um, it's important that we get it right. So when we talk about culture, what is culture? Um, so I've just got a couple of definitions here. So the GLOW project is a well-known project that looked at a lot of different uh, countries and leadership styles and competencies. And they defined um, culture as shared motives, values, beliefs, identities, and interpretations or meanings of significant events that result from common experiences of members of collectives that are transmitted across generations. And this idea of common experiences that are transferred across generations is really important because when we move into a new um, culture, everything that all of our frame of reference, our assumptions, our beliefs, et cetera, are formed from common experiences that were somewhere else. And indeed, when we go back from the culture, when we return back to Australia, there were gaps. There were gaps that we totally missed and references that we miss even to today because uh, that were on television shows or the Olympics or whatever that, that everyone talks about and we just we just, we just have a gap there. Um, culture is collective programming of the mind which distinguishes the members of one human group to another. Culture in this sense includes systems of values and values are among the building block of our culture. Now, Hofstede is somebody who, who is a bit of a guru in this field. He's done a lot of work. And I think that idea, again, it's talking about systems of values. Our values are formed by the environment and the experiences that we have. And the last one is more of a business um, focus from Deloitte. Culture is the long-standing, largely implicit shared values, beliefs, and assumptions that influence behavior, attitudes, and meaning in a company. Now, I think what's really important here is the idea of implicit because, because we don't go around and identify what, what, what um, apart from stereotypical, what is actually our culture cultural um, uh, ways and we, we're we not often conscious about them in our day-to-day -day work. Um, so it's, a lot of the time what happens is that um, the most insightful cultural ob observers are often outsiders and indeed what I found when I went to when I went and lived in different cultures is that I learned a lot more about myself when I was in the different cultures because it was like holding up a mirror when you're in the same environment, you don't notice it as much. But when you are dealing with different people in different environment with different beliefs and values, etc., you really start to understand what's important to yourself and the way you behave. Um, 
Culture influences how people behave and how people understand their own actions. This is important as well, is about whenever we land in a business or we land in a country and we're dealing with other people, it's really important for us to understand how we ch choosing to behave and what is the impact of our behavior on others? How are they, how are they uh, receiving our behavior and interpreting it? Um, and what impact is it having on them? And the last thing is culture is resilience. Its elements are longstanding, not a matter of fads. And you would you would probably understand that a lot of the way you do things are ingrained. And we 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 they especially when we're under stress, we go back to the things that that really are part of our DNA and part of our part of our culture and part of the way we we we're used to behaving. So, so humans are driven by a shared culture and individual personalities. And this is another point that I want to make is that when we talk about culture, we often talk about the German culture or the Australian culture, but there are many layers. So there are individuals' personalities. There are also individuals' um, individuals own culture how they work within their culture there's also then the the family or the the community culture and then there's also the organization culture or the team culture so we have layers of culture and it's really important um, you know, I'm not going to be the same as my husband or my friend. We're, we're all different, but we are all Australians and we need to recognise that there's just not one size fits all. Um, so the implications of this is as leaders and managers, we need to take the time to take more notice of what we think and do in different situations, understand why we do things the way we do and why others do things the way they do. Um, notice our own hidden biases, um, be curious and have an open mindset when engaging with others, notice the impact of what we say and what we do on others around us and challenge our own assumptions. And, and as somebody in a different culture, we're very able to do that if we keep an open mind and we, we keep a curious mind. And that way we will learn a lot about the other culture and also about ourselves and become more effective. So um, I also, I'm not going to go too much into theory, but I did want to give you a few little frameworks to help us to, uh, you know, to talk about some of these concepts. Um, you all probably would have heard of the iceberg model, which was first coined by Edward Hall in 1976. Um, he suggested that culture is analogous to an iceberg and that only 10% of the iceberg is visible at any given time and a large part is hidden beneath the surface. And the same actually goes for organisational culture. So when we join a new organisation, um, when we, when we, so for example, an Australian person joining a German organisation here in Australia, what they see is the goals, the vision, the structure, the policies, the same as a German, um, a German expat coming to Australia and, and leading the business here. They, they will have a view of all these kind of um, visible, observable words and actions, which are apparent to, to, to anyone who observes them. And that, that's great, but there's actually a whole lot of stuff that happens below the surface, um, which is about the way, not the way we say we do things, but the way we really do things, how we get things done. And that's to do with things like... Um, uh, you know, the, the things that aren't observable are how we feel the core values should be reflected in specific situations um, in our daily life, such as working or socialising. It's also around how we interpret, how we interpret different situations based on what we've learnt. And, and the things that influence, um, uh, you know, the formative factors are things around our education, and the education system, the the, the um, our religion, the media—they're all the things that we've experienced as we're growing up, and and they sort of form um, all these unwritten values and beliefs and perceptions that will bring a lens to a situation that might be different to the people who are in that country. Um, okay, I'm racing through these so we can get to the meaty part that everyone wants to hear about. So. Um, <laughs> 
so so this is a I wanted to take you through this model that was um, put together by Erin Meyer. Erin is a, a professor at INSEAD and she's worked a lot with international business leaders. And what she did was she put together a framework that was really about um she wanted to under, she wanted to help international executives to pinpoint their leadership preferences and compare their methods to management styles um, of other cultures. And what she says is that by decoding these cultural differences, um, it impacts um, international business and um, their effectiveness. So you can become more effective by really being able to understand where the differences are and how to deal with those. Um, so she came up with eight key dimensions of areas that managers should be aware of when trying to understand and get things done across cultures um, so that we can adapt and adjust our styles. So let's just take a look at these areas. Can you all see that? It's quite small, but... Um, we we uh, can see it. You can see it? Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I just want to take you through these areas and you might just want to have a think about this because... We're going to have a look where Germany and Australia sit, and we're also. I'd also like you to think about that when I take you through some real life examples of what others kind of have told me about their experience. So, so the first one is around communication, and we're going to talk a lot about communication in it, 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 further down the track in this presentation. But the, the what they talk about here is high context or low context communication. So, the the idea is we we all of us all of the different cultures land somewhere on the continuum of these 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 um, eight competency areas and we want to see where where um, Australia and Germany land. Um, the thing to remember is that it's all relative. Um, it's relative to the country we're talking about. So so let's talk at the first one is communicating. Um, so this scale looks at the degree to which cultures um, are, low context cultures, which means that um, if they're very low context, it means that good communication is precise, simple, explicit and clear and messages are expressed and understood at face value. Um, so we would have countries like Germany, the USA, the Netherlands, who are very much on that end. Um, a high context culture is more um, countries like Japan, India, um, where communication is more nuanced and sophisticated and layered. Messages are both spoken and read between the lines and there's less put in writing um, and more left to verbal uh, interpretation. So that's the first one is communication. The second one is around evaluating and this scale is looking at the preference for frank versus diplomatic um, criticism and this is one that comes up a lot when we talk about um, the difference between German and Australian leadership. Um, so so um, basically it's looking at how open and direct is, uh, uh, is the leader or the leadership in giving um, negative feedback. Do they say it how it is? Do they, um, you know, give give people the real information and quite directly, or are they, or are they sort of less less open to doing that, and they're using a more nuanced and shying away from giving direct feedback. Um, so, so the the difference there is. Um, um, is that um, like people like the Spanish, the Mexicans are equally high context. Spanish are much more direct with their, um, yeah. So um, with their negative feedback than Mexicans. So you can you can be um, you can be low context, as in you can you can be very um, straightforward with your information and with your communicating, but you can also be indirect in your negative feedback. So they don't necessarily go together is what I'm saying there. So, but but in Australia and German relationship, that's definitely a difference um, uh, between the two. Um, the next one is leading. Um, so either being egalitarian or hierarchical, this is another area where we see differences between Australia and Germany. So on this scale, we're looking at the degree of respect and deference shown to authority figures, placing people on a spectrum between egalitarian and hierarchical. So is is the hierarchy, the the the, the formality of the hierarchy, does that define if you like the power, the decision making, and 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 the way 
um, and the respect that people are given or is it more egalitarian where people sort of earn their respect more from um, the relationship and the trust they build and less from that from the hierarchy um, the next one is around decision making so we have consensual or we have top down um, so so this is really around um, the scale explores the differences between building team agreement or relying on one individual, the boss, to make the decisions. So there's there's two ends of the scale there on that one. Um, trusting, trusting is around how um, how uh, colleagues and um, and people who work together how they develop trust. And on on the left hand side is task based, and that's more around. Um, a cognitive type of trust, trust from the head. It's around, um, uh, you know, we we build trust by working together. We work well together. We do the we we do the work together. We like each other, and therefore we trust each other. The other side of it is relationship based, and it's more from the heart. It's about, you know, um, it's 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 an effective connection, and you, you see. You see places like um, Japan um, and India that are very much relationship based. So, so that's two ends of the scale as well. And in fact, that's one of the areas where Australia and um, Germany are very similar um, on the task based end of the scale, which is interesting. Um, disagreeing. So this is another area where we have um, differences coming out. Um, you know, is disagreement um, open? And um, do people feel comfortable uh, confronting one another and having a productive, open discussion that talks about difference? Or do people avoid confrontation and see, see uh, disagreement as something that's um, uncomfortable and something to be avoided. Um, so, how open and how how objective and how constructive can can the discussion be around disagreement? Um, scheduling is the next one, and this is around um, uh, all businesses follow timetables, but some cultures um, they treat the schedule as a suggestion, whereas some people treat it as a promise. Yeah, and this is one that you will see coming up quite often when you talk about the differences between Australia and uh, Germany. So many of the people that I talk to, they um, they complain about this idea that Australia is that you you give some an Australian a deadline and they'll say and you'll ask them whether that's okay and they'll say, yep, no worries. She'll be right. We'll do that. And nine times out of ten, um, they 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 perhaps don't meet that deadline, and this is something that's very frustration frustrating for German leaders, both here in Australia and in Germany, that um, they never quite know whether they're going to get what they say is going to be delivered, and it's very different to the German approach. And it's actually some a reason why I love working with German companies because they're so structured and they do do what they say they're going to do. So, um, so that's one. That's another area. And the last one is around persuading, and this is around um, how um, how people that the the pattern, I guess, the how people go about um, approaching a a problem and. Um, persuading others and in 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 on the one end of the scale is principles per first and that's really more a deductive type of um, persuasion and the other side is applications first which is more an inductive or a sort of an iterative process so um so so the the deductive process is really um principles first it derives from conclusions or facts it, it you you know, first of all you look at um general principles or concepts and then you draw um, you draw conclusions from those from the facts whereas applications first is looking at general con conclusions are reached based on a pattern of factual observations from the real world and this is an area which is very different between Australia and Germany as well and this will come up again and again and the thing is, is that we, we most people will use both of those um, forms of persuasion, but we have formed a habitual way that is more of our preference. And a lot of the time that habitual way is formed from our education. 
um, background. And, um, you know, we know that the German education background is very much one that um, that the really teaches people that they have to have their own opinion and that they have to question things and they really have to have the evidence um, to 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 back up their argument or back up their opinion. And um, the, the Australian um, education system is not as strong on that basis. It's depending on the discipline it is, but we're, we're very much a, you know, have a go, get into it and try try things and, and adjust things as we go. So it is quite different. And um, I've actually experienced that. We've had two, um, two students come and stay with us um, for six months at a time and go to school. And we've, we've had lots of conversations around that and how it plays out. So, so let's just have a quick look. How are we going for time? All right. I think we need to go through this quickly. Let me just show you these areas that... Um, the differences are so you'll see that the areas where there's a lot of differences in that hierarchical egalitarian area um, where where Germans more sort of focused on the hierarchy and Australia egalitarian um, another big one is the principles first and the applications first you'll see and the other areas that tend to come up a lot are the disagreeing the scheduling and the um, you know the the evaluating the, the, the um, so so that's a very quick overview. I want to just go through some of the results that I got. Um, uh, I did a survey of um, a number of companies that I work with. Um, and yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah you, Jane, you, you mentioned it to me and, and I wanted to pick up on that um, because you said you, you did that. I think, um, please correct me if it's wrong, but I think about 10 clients um, round about that. And you said, I think there were mostly family businesses. Um, and so the, the smaller ones, um, surely, but there were 50% uh, Germans and 50% um, Australian participants um, in the leader management role or the senior management role. Is that correct? Can you give us That's some right. insights? Yeah. Yeah, so I work with a lot of those hidden champions, the Mittelstein companies from Germany who, um, you know, they're quite big globally uh, in, in Germany and around the world, but they often have a small presence here. You know, they can be anywhere from 20 to 200 or 250 people. And um, basically, yeah, I just I just did a bit of a survey um, and, yeah, there was half expats German managers who come to lead the business here in Australia and half Australians who really who lead the business here in Australia and deal with Germany. So I just wanted to give you some insights about what does it look like on the ground, these cultural differences? How does it play out? So, so we just run through these um, because I know we need to do questions as well. Um, so, so one of the key, key areas was um, what were the key differences in leadership thinking and mindset? And um, a lot of people said that there, were, there, there, were, there was a lot of um, synergies between the leadership and mindset, but the areas that, that where differences came out were things like um, uh, approaches uh, to risk, communication style, decision-making, hierarchy and cultural inclusivity um, where, where noticeable differences were. Um, some of the key areas that, that came out were things around cultural proximity and awareness. And this is around the idea that um, uh, th there's such a difference in things like um, the size of the market and the way the market works with, uh, with Australian businesses dealing with end users a lot of the time. A lot of these businesses are sales and distribution businesses and they that having to um, sell their products through over long distances and have salespeople traveling long ways, have logistics that go different ways it is very different to the German market where it's large wholesale, um, large OEMs, large large businesses that they're selling to. So there's and and there was a, a, a little bit of an idea that sometimes sometimes the sense of urgency from Germany for decisions um, around um, changes in strategy or for for um, responses to things was was a little bit too far away um flexibility and adaptability um this is this is again around the um the the germans tend to everybody recognize that the germans tend to spend a long time on planning and um 
telling you how the plan's put together, um, how do we get to where we need to go to, what do we put in, we spend the time on it. But once we've got to that, then we execute on it and we don't sort of, we don't, um, we don't change it. In Australia, what tends to happen is that um, we gather the facts, we plan, we implement, and we adjust and learn as we go. And and sometimes the German planning can be too slow for businesses who do have to adjust to market conditions and to competitors. And that is a big area that comes up again and again between the businesses. Um, the other thing, which is very much a thing of head office anyway, and and in any country, I think, and a and a and a, and a, a subsidiary business is that the German or European centric thinking does not always suit uh, suit um, overseas subsidiaries. Um, uh, um, yeah, and it's very hard to for for managers over here to contrast and explain the different characteristics between the markets and get people to understand them in Germany. Um, marketing is another big area where they they talk about the fact that um, uh, you know that because because Australians are working with end users and consumers and they're competing with a lot of um, a lot of different um, small uh, competitors and some a lot of cheaper competitors that marketing is really important it's not not good enough to say Australian made and that's going to be the attractor sorry German made that's going to be the attractor that they need to really get into marketing and do a lot more work around social media and and making the marketing suitable for Australia adjusting it to Australia and talking to the Australian subsidiary about what's needed um and some of the, 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 a lot of them have talked about challenges around that and around digital tools. Um, decision making processes are also um, are, are also important. Um, so so again, it's around the Germans are proud of the process and the decisions that are made. Um, and and it's important for the people sitting in the leaders sitting in Australia to to really sort of take notice and show that they've listened to the decision making process. To really, um, to really take the time then to um, think about their strategy and their response to that and to, to explain and educate to the German um, head office about how they came to their strategy. We don't tend to do that as much. We tend to sort of focus on what we're doing and get on with it. And it's really important to have that two way of sharing, not just the what, but the why. And to to really understand that the leader is the middle person. They really need to, they, they're here to, with them. they should have a mindset to represent the Australian business, but they also got to translate the strategy from the global strategy to an Australian um, strategy and get the buy-in from, from some of the people involved there. Um, so, so hierarchy is also a big one. Um, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Direct, directive versus consultative leadership. One of the big things that, that leaders struggle with here in Australia if they're German coming here is the amount of consultation. It's a different consultation to what the consultation you do in Germany to get feedback. It's about getting buy-in. It's about socialising decisions. It's about taking the time to really collaborate with, with your um, teams and making sure that they feel that they're part of the process of decision-making and strategy. Um, and that's something that a lot of German leaders struggle with initially. Um, performance versus qualification is around talent. You know, the, the Germans will look at your qualifications for the job, whereas Australians tend to look at performance, past performance. Um, and this this idea of local versus headquarters mindset, as a as a, we you know, as the representative of the Australian business, um, it really is about um, you know um, a, a pre, getting getting the appreciation of the size of Australia, the distances, the costs involved. There's a lot of there's a lot of education and influence that's needed because Australia is seen as a, an expensive um, operation for what it delivers. So um, that's one of the struggles that that people name. Um, I just go through this. I'm just going to run through this quickly and you can you can ask me questions about this. We, I asked about the how they had to adapt the style and ways of working to be successful in Australia. The types of things that came up were around adjusting away from this, um, having to do everything 100 percent 
correct before you act, get everything 100% right, which is kind of more the German mentality and getting used to doing things maybe 90 or 95% right, acting before you're totally sure, you know, just just being a bit more agile. Um, managing local expectations, we've, we've talked about that um, uh, and, and it's about really making sure that you don't come in and say, well, Germany said this or Germany said we're going to do that, but really sort of making, thinking about how you translate the story for your team in Australia. Um, frequent and informal communication is really important. Um, this whole thing around communication is important because we're not just talking about um, what you say we're talking about the way you say it. and one of the one of the um one of the managers put it really nicely whilst most german colleagues speak reasonable english the devil is in the detail german language is very direct to the point that if translated word for word it appears aggressive and strong this is unintentional but it has upset a lot of my german co my australian colleagues over the years it is important to develop an understanding of the language fine print and maximise verbal communication to avoid misunderstandings. And I think that is a really important point is that the way la the languages are structured, the way that they're, the tone, um, the, the words even, German, German language is a much more exact language. It can put people off just because, not because of what you're saying, but the way you're saying and the way you're delivering it. Um, uh, yeah, inclusive results and oriented approach. This whole idea of including people is really something that's um, important. And 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 Australians need to be more direct and patient and persistent when it comes to de de decision making processes and getting decisions from Germany. So they have to back what they're asking for with extensive data and external sources. Um, I'm rushing through this, Connie, because um, I can see our time's just about to run out. Uh, no worries, no worries. <laughs> yeah, so so um, what German ways of working have you found to be beneficial in your success in Australia? Um, so so these um, these are the things that people value from the German way of working, the disciplined work ethic, the strategic long-term planning, that that idea that we 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 have it's a long-term endeavor. Whilst it can be frustrating, it's about focusing on sustainable growth and this whole vision and commitment to, to family values and commitment to people. Um, attention to detail and using the data to make sure that we have a we have substance to our, our strategy. Um, target so so there's a difference between um, orientation to targets or relationships. Australia being more relationship based, um, Germany being more sort of focused on targets and, um, you know, just coming to the table when you've got a problem with the with with some data, with a thought out solution, with supporting arguments. This is a really good thing to learn from the Germans and and also really staying focused on the goal. You know, you've got the goal out there, whatever happens, stay focused on it to navigate what happens in between. Um, so um, some of the nuances, um, I'm going to skip that one. I'm going to go on to what advice would you give uh, to Germans and Australian leaders to succeed here? So the things really are blend your approaches. So really think about what your strengths are and adjust, adjust them, but use them to do well in Australia as well and to get buy-in from people. So, so if you're if you're good at humour, use your humour, but use it in a way that's going to really sort of resonate with your people. Um, and you see down the bottom there that one of the things that we do do is we we really sort of um we we really um you know have a go at ourselves and take take a joke on ourselves and if you can use your humor in that way um it can be really uh really valuable understanding the cultural nuances so really understand the informal formality so how does it work here how can you how can you communicate with your team how can you get respect from your team that's not about title it's about how you build a relationship with them um how can you co collaborate and include others? Um, it's also important to stay educated about the business culture, the compliance and the governance here in Australia um, and, and continually get feedback on people about whether what they say they're going to do, it really are going to do it and keep pushing them on it. 
Um, and and use your network. Network is really important in Australia. And basically, you know, your first successes or failures will really lay lay the impact and lay the foundations for how you do moving forward. Um, I'm going to leave it at that and open it to questions quickly. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry to have to race through that. No, no, no. I, I think it was absolutely fascinating. And I know we could talk about this for uh, much, much longer. But of course, um, we want to give the audience also the possibility to ask their questions, which they might have um, had before already um, or which came up uh, right now. So I would encourage you, if um, you have uh, a question which um, comes up, please put it into the QA. Um, and we are here and particularly having here the expert um, who's um, hopefully able to give you um, a quick answer to it. Um, while we are waiting that uh, there is um, a question coming up, I, I have one here already, and um, that would be, um, for example, what do you believe is the um, percentage of cultural differences and issues related really to the language problem? Uh, because you mentioned it just before that it has such an impact, obviously, how we are um, putting the words and the sentences together. Yeah, I think in the early stages, it's pretty high, you know, it would be at least um, 50%. I think it goes down as somebody adjusts and, and learns to to change it. But, the, but as people are getting to know someone new or getting to know their environment, that's where we make the mistakes. And if we don't if we don't sort of notice the visual feedback or the or the the feedback from people how they react, we can really, um, you know, we can really make a mess of things. Um, and you know, a number of people have said that they really get they 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 get they get um, people that they know and trust to give them feedback on that. But but you know, just that 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 uh, quote that I shared with you that the. the the way um, we talk is quite different. The language we use, how direct we are, you know, there's this whole thing about Australia's or always have to say, hi, how are you? How are you doing in emails and things like that? If you if you don't sort of adjust to that, it can really make or break um, relationship building. Mm -hmm. We have another here um, and um, uh, it says, have you seen any changes in communication and collaboration within the digital world? Distances become shorter, traveling easier, or is it not necessary anymore? Uh, as in traveling is not necessary anymore. I, think I would probably... understand that, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I believe that um, you still need to have those personal connections. You could, you the, the things that you learn about people are not just what you see on screen or you hear. You really need to kind of get some context around it and really get a, a feel for what goes on in the room and what goes on out of the room, you know, and, yeah. and and those dynamics that we were talking at the bottom of the iceberg, they're the things that you work out and you start to get a feel for when you're there in person, you have the official meetings and the unofficial meetings. And it's really, it's really critical, but perhaps we don't need to do it as much. We need to think about what the purpose is of our travel and what we can do online and what we need to do um, in person. person yeah um, what are the pros and cons of doing business directly from journey Germany or via local business partners distributors because that is also a way people start smoothly I call it always. yeah I think a lot of a lot of businesses start with a distribution partner and it needs to be one that you can trust and um, a lot of people deal with exclusive business partners because the problem is if they're not exclusive um, your products can get lost in a whole lot of other products and the German products are they are high end most of the yeah. time and they are expensive and they need to be positioned well. So you need to educate uh, those distributors or partners really about what the value add is. And if, if if they're selling a whole lot of other products and they have to make a lot more effort to sell the expensive ones and educate people, they're not going to spend as much time on that. And I've seen that where um, German companies actually buy their distributor and they put somebody one of their own employees in and suddenly they start to realize well what what, what was this person doing you know they were yeah. selling the the easy products and not the hard ones you know um, yeah. so but I think you can do it with a distributor you just got to find the right one 
um, with being here in the country, you really get to understand those um, a lot of those things that we talked about, about the differences in the market and what's going to make it, how can the German business help Australia to succeed and vice versa by, by having that exchange of information and um, knowledge and education. Mm -hmm. um, someone um, uh, is quite happy with the whole presentation, but has the question of what is your opinion um, on Australians being a lower context culture than Germans, according to the map? Mm. Yeah, look, I, it is an area that I that I sort of wonder about as well um it's it's what's come out there i think we we um we're not and this is where there was those those the the two things around um context and um communication so so um communication i think that um, is is sorry low context and high text context communication we can say it how it is we don't muck around with that but we don't we do muck around when it's we we do sort of uh you know, we aren't as direct when it comes to delivering messages that are that we, we we add a lot more personal stuff into our things. We take the personal into account. There's not the separation of being objective and being personal. And I think that's where the difference happens, if that makes sense. Yes, yes. I think we have uh, reached more or less um, our time uh, limit. Um, Joanne, thank you very, very much for this excellent and insightful presentation. It was really fascinating. And as I said before, we could talk about it much longer. And I'm absolutely confident that each of you could find a few key takeaways tonight. And I hope we could motivate you to put some of these presented ideas into action in the future. I would also like to mention that uh, we will provide you with Joanne's presentation in the coming days. So everything she has said is not lost and um, you don't have to remember everything, um, but it is. it will be there for you to uh, have a look into it. So I can only say at this um, time now, thank you very much for your attention. Again, thank you to Joanne. I hope that today's topic has shown you that bridging cultural differences is key to success and should be part of management or leadership onboarding for a smooth and uncomplicated entry in Australia. In this regard, I wish you a wonderful day in Germany and a lovely evening in Australia. Goodbye, and we will look forward to welcoming you to the next webinar in 2024. Good night.